Good morning. Thank you very much for being here so early today. It's a pleasure for me to welcome you to this press conference of the ILC 2018. Uh, we have the pleasure of having here the authors of some of the abstracts we selected as having uh, impact on the care of our patients and uh, we would like uh, the population, general population, to be aware of what is happening in the field of liver disease. So it's my pleasure to invite the first of these authors to come and present uh, his data. It's Dr. Scott Johnson, who will present the abstract early versus delayed hepatitis C treatment provides uh, increased health benefit at lower cost, a pangenotypic cost effectiveness analysis set. Good morning. Um, I'm Scott Johnson. I am an economist. Uh, don't hold that against me. Um, Sammy Saab from UCLA was the uh, uh, physician on this uh, research. Um, it was sponsored by AbbVie. So uh, I'm going to try to give a uh, abbreviated version of the of the presentation. There are essentially a lot of uh, people in. Um, in, in Europe uh, who still have HCV. Uh, HCV uh, causes a lot of um, hepatic complications, um, uh, uh, liver disease, as well as extra hepatic manifestations, such as cardiovascular <laughs> disease, um, diabetes, kidney disease. There are uh, regimens which have very high SVR rates, which are um, uh, essentially alleviate a lot of the disease burden. Um, in this research, we're going to look at a, a pan-genotypic -geno treatment, glucaprovir and pibrentosphere. Um, and we're going to assess treating a patient who has mild disease versus one who has moderate disease versus one who has advanced disease. And uh, the motivation for this research is that in, in parts of Europe um, and, and parts of the world, payers restrict access to uh, HCV therapies um, by uh, fibrosis stage. And so some uh, countries may limit access to those who just have advanced disease, and some may have uh, uh, no access uh, restrictions. Some may do some sort of prioritization based on the degree of liver fibrosis. And so in, in this project, we're going to essentially have identical patients in a cost-effectiveness model. It, one would have mild, one would have moderate, one would have advanced disease, and we're going to compare their outcomes and consider these policies in that context. We're also going to uh, assess models with and without extrahepatic manifestations. So just to speed through uh, the methods, we're using a health state transition model, which is very uh, similar to all the models that have been used by payers to assess the cost effectiveness of therapies for HCV. And here, here's that model. And so this is a health state transition model. So essentially people exist in, uh, in these different health states and every um, uh, time period in the model, we turn the crank and probabilities reallocate uh, patients. And so a, Early stage um, patient would start at F0, F1 on the Metavir scale, and a later stage patient would start an, an advanced disease would, would start at F4, compensated cirrhosis, CC there. Two things to note about this model is that reinfection is possible, as well as if you could note the, um, the transition from the blue SVR history of F4 to HCC. So even after a uh, successful therapeutic outcome in SVR, a patient could still move to hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, owing to their, uh, the advanced uh, nature of their disease. Um, so there was a survey that uh, essentially examined uh, the current patient characteristics in the UK of, of patients with HCV, how many are naive with regards to therapy versus experienced, their age, their gender, um, what fibrosis stage they're in. If you notice, uh, the majority in the UK um, uh, are in a mild, uh, have mild disease. That's either F0 or F1 on the Metavir scale. 
So if you, you uh, note we have costs uh, corresponding to those different health states, those different bubbles on that um, diagram, and there are some that have um, extra hepatic manifestations there on the right, and in the, the central column you can see that excludes extra hepatic manifestations. The difference would be from all those causes uh, aside from the, um, the, the liver complications. So now some, some results. You know, we've, we've turned the crank on the model and everyone sort of flowed through. And so we're looking at lifetime outcomes um, for our simulated patients. And you can see w there's a lifetime risk of decompensated cirrhosis, of hepatocellular carcinoma, liver transplant, and liver-related death. Just to focus on, on the liver-related death as an example, the, uh, the first um, sort of light blue bar, the 3.8% corresponds to this is the lifetime risk for those patients who had mild disease. And the middle bar is for those who had moderate, and the bar on the right is for those who had compensated cirrhosis. So for all these outcomes, the um, sort, sort of best outcome is uh, experienced by those who started F0, F1, and the worst by those who have advanced disease. Uh, one would note that the SVR rate, the sort of therapy success rate for, for both the, for the mild, the moderate, and the compensated cirrhosis, again, the three bars, is very, very high and very similar for all um, three uh, patient types. However, the lifetime qualities or quality-adjusted life years, this is sort of the aggregate benefit, like how does the patient feel for the rest of their life? Um, you, you can see that there's quite a difference, uh, just like the results from the prior slide where you saw greater um, liver-related burden. Here we have qualities associated with um, mild, moderate, um, advanced patients. The advanced patients have, um, you know, 10 sixteenths of the um, sort of uh, lifespan and quality of life that those who, who were treated when they were mild. So for sure, like the payer is still going to be very um, focused on costs. And they might say, sure, I, un I understand that um, mild patients might have greater benefit, but for sure I'll, I'll be um, saving resources. However, ac actually, you see here that the, the cost of treating the um, F4CC patient, the, the bar that's uh, the greenish color, is, is much higher. It's almost twice as what it is for a mild patient. And so the payer's actually paying more to treat these advanced patients, and that, that's because there's a greater disease burden that's borne by the patient, but also because you're treating, you're treating with a longer regimen. And so about 40,000 of the 60,000 pounds is just drug treatment. And so that would be spent sort of right away. So even just based on drug treatment uh, costs alone, it makes more sense to treat the earlier stage patients. So when we r roll up all these outcomes, basically what we get is that it costs less to treat mild patients versus um, uh, advanced patients, even compared to, to moderate patients. Um, the mild patients produce more value, just the, uh, it's it said that they're dominant in the sense that it, it increases quality of life for patients, but it reduces costs. Um, the, uh, I think along those lines, you know, just to sort of wrap up, that the motivation of this research was to have payers um, reconsider their, uh, their, their policies based on, on their own cost-effectiveness um, analyses. Um, and also to present research with extra hepatic manifestations. This is the first model that does that. Um, uh, there are limitations to this data. It, uh, these SVR inputs, for example, are, are from the clinical trials. It looks in two presentations. If, if everyone just wait two presentations, there'll be actually real world data. So maybe we can get rid of that first limitation. But um, other limitations include um, uh, that, you, you know, these models operate on average values, and there could be variation in different subgroups. Um, extra hepatic uh, risks were not modeled explicitly, but incorporated it as um, average annual costs. Um, we're, we're modeling over a lifetime horizon, which I think is, is theoretically appropriate, uh, but for sure if you had different time horizons um, and potentially different settings, the, the results could be different. But in general, the uh, pan-genotypic treatment with GP at earlier fibrosis stages is cost effective and even dominant, meaning that it produces more quality of life at a lower cost compared to treatment at, at later stages. So questions, comments? Yes, yes please. Uh, 
Sure. Um, there is a Lancet November 2017, I think, Allison et al. Um, I, I, could, I could show you after this, but in that Lancet in November 2017, there's a, a the, the entire article is about ways in which payers restrict access to HPV therapies, and so that would be a great source. Um, in the UK, I know that Scotland restricts access to just later stage patients, which is why this is set in, in Scotland. Yes. Right. That's a great question, and I am not sure that I can answer it. In the United States, it, it's of course a very different setting where you have um, uh, Medicare and Medicaid as large public payers, and then private payers. Uh, my understanding is, is that, that these uh, restrictions are, are less common in the United States, but I, uh, I don't know. Is there any other question from the audience? Yes? In other words, everyone has to stay. Yes. So, with regards to the cost of treating liver disease, I think costs are higher in the U.S., and I think a lot of that has to do with labor costs being higher in the U.S. Um, with regards to drug prices, I think that it is always hard to tell. You know, in the U.S., the treatment is more often. Most matters are quite related to the risk prices, and you know, payers are often. In Scotland, there are those prices are for treating the same Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. We will move to the next presentation. This is given by Dr. Annika Berquist. And, and it's entitled statins are associated with reduced mortality and morbidity in primary sclerosing cholangiety. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you for, for letting me present. That's very nice. And our study is uh, on statins and we show that they are associated with reduced mortality and morbidity in PSC. Nothing to disclose. So primary sclerosis in cholangitis is a chol chronic cholestatic liver disease that is closely associated to inflammatory bowel disease. And in Sweden, where this study comes from, the association is uh, very close and nearly 80% of all PC patients have also an IBD. This disease is progressive and there is actually no treatment that could halt its progression to cirrhosis, development of liver failure, need of liver transplantation eventually. 
And uh, there is also a very well documented increased risk for cholangiocarcinoma. Statin use has recently uh, been uh, uh, associated with reduced mortality. It has been used in portal hypertension for some time, but there is uh, increasing evidence that it is also associated with with improved prognosis. And this is the data from a, a meta-analysis from last year showing that statin use reduced mortality in cirrhotic patients. And here's another uh, large uh, study from Taiwan, an epidemiological study, uh, that shows that also this statin effect may be dose dependent. So therefore, with this background, we decided to explore the possible effect of exposure to several drugs, uh, including statins, with a specific focus on statins in patients with prim primary sclerosis and cholangitis in a population-based setting in Sweden. To this end, we can use our Swedish registers, the health, health registries. Every Swedish citizen are assigned a personal identity identification number, and therefore we can follow all patients through all registers and also have a very close follow-up. And the register we have used, there are classical registers in Sweden with a very great coverage of over 99%, the death register, the Swedish cancer register, and the patient register, both out, out and inpatient registries. The latest register that has been launched in Sweden is the prescribed drug register. Here, all this dispensed drugs are registered for all patients or all persons uh, at, at the different pharmacies. And that was started in 2005, and this is when our study starts. So what we did is that we looked in our registries and identified patients with sclerosis and cholangitis. There is no specific diagnostic code for PSC, and therefore we defined the primary cause of sclerosis and cholangitis as uh, patients that also had uh, a concomitant ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So we excluded a lot of patients here and ended up with nearly 3,000 patients and we linked them to the different registers and followed them through this time period 2005 to 16. At end of follow-up 2016, 80% uh, were alive 3.4% uh, were transplanted and nearly 20% had died. After that, we anal <laughs> analyzed the risks by using Cox regression, and we choose to look at three different outcomes of relevance to this uh, study population. All-cause mortality is, of course, interesting, but the combination, the composite endpoint, mortality in liver transplantation is also relevant, as well as the composite endpoints sometimes used in clinical trials, liberated mortality, liver transplantation, uh, liver cancer, or bleeding from uh, esophageal varices. Uh, we treated uh, drug exposure as time varying, meaning that the first dispension of the drug from the pharmacy was the onset of exposure for each patient and then were thereafter followed as an exposed patient. And all risk assessment were adjusted for age, uh, at PC diagnosis, PC diagnosis date, date of IBD and sex. And here are our results. Uh, this is a clinical overview of uh, uh, the cohort. As you can see, the mean age of the patients are around 40 at PC diagnosis. Uh, we had a total uh, follow-up of 11,000 patient years. There is a male predominance, and the majority had ulcerative colitis uh, as the phenotype of their IBD, and this is quite expected. This is representative of any uh, PC population. We looked at many drugs, and this is uh, um, um, some of them. Uh, Ursodeoxycholic acid, uh, here, 60% were exposed. This is exposure frequencies for the different drugs in the population. 60% had received ursodeoxycholic acid, which is the only uh, 
uh, frequently used treatment today, but there is uh, the evidence for their uh, its efficiency is scarce, as you know. Uh, statins was used in 14%, and uh, might as well mention antibiotics, which nearly everybody had dispensed at some time point. And this is the main result table. Uh, this is, uh, these are the risk estimates, the hazard ratios for exposure to different drugs in relation to the different outcomes. And if we start with ursodeoxycholic acid, you can see that uh, the, the hazard ratio is around one, uh, and that should be interpreted uh, as that this does not have an effect, even might have a little increased risk for these outcomes. However, we, we, we uh, don't know if these patients receiving ERSO had a more severe disease. Statins, which is the subject of, uh, of this presentation, was the dr drug that was the most beneficial for this study population. As you can see, the hazard ratio for mortality and river transportation was 0.5, meaning that the risk for having a liver transplant or dying is halved if you are exposed to statins. Um, of course, there are limitations to such an epidemiological study. We have limited clinical information on these patients. We have no uh, information on the indication on the drugs or the clinical status of the patients and we cannot exclude residual confounders such as smoking and alcohol and so on. And you can always question compliance, although uh, we believe that if a person has dispensed the drug at the pharmacy, it's more likely that they have been exposed than the, the doctor just prescribed it. Um, to the strengths is that we have very high quality registers in Sweden and there is a lot of uh, confirmational studies on that and we have almost complete follow-up. And we also define the diagnosis very cautiously, uh, taking away all patients with sclerosis and cholangitis of possible secondary causes. So in conclusion, statin use in patients with PSC are associated with reduced risks for death, liver transplant transplantation and severe liver adverse events. And the risk is halved for liver transplantation and death. Uh, I want to point out that this is a hypothesis generating study. Uh, and this is not the base to treat everybody with statins, but it is definitely a promising candidate for further clinical trials. Thank you for your attention. It's open for discussion, please. Hi, uh, Neil Osterow with Medscape Medical News. Um, I noticed that uh, in your uh, in your results, azathioprine. Yes. Had very, yeah, had very yeah. similar. Uh, it was also a bit reduced. Um, uh, and and uh, it could be it could be discussed whether this has um, uh, an effect or not. Uh, I think that azathioprine is used very much in IBD, and therefore it's very difficult to say um, whether this has um, um, an impact on the PSC itself. Uh, you can say. I am afraid that, that uh, since we know that the type of IBD and the uh, activity of IBD has an impact on the PEC progression, that this is, a, that the, this is um, uh, not a, a causative um, association. And we cannot say anything about this. Azathioprine is also studied and it's, 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 it has not been effective before. Hi, Ed Sussman with uh, MedPage today. Um, the use of statins in these patients was not directly aimed at um, their um, um, the disease they're, they're studying at. These were people who were using statins um, 
for other reasons, is that right? Yeah, well, we don't know why they got statins. Of course, we are worried that uh, patients that had a more mild disease uh, uh, were, were uh, considered to be um, more beneficial to statins because they, they probably got statins for diabetes or heart disease or, or, or other things. Uh, but, uh, and also we were afraid of uh, uh, the age that uh, if you get the, um, the PSC in younger uh, age, you, can, you, could possibly, um, you could possibly have a more severe disease and so on. But we, we have adjusted for PSC uh, duration and, 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 and age, and, and still there is this risk. But this is the general problem, and this is why we need to um, uh, analyze this or, or perform more more or less a clinical trial to say if this association is of real, true benefit. Is, is there any, um, are there any people who treat uh, PSE with statins now? Uh, I, I, I don't think so. Uh, I, we definitely don't. Uh, based on this data, we, we are actually planning to move forward and, and perform a, try to perform a clinical study, but it is a clinical challenge since this is, these treatments are very cheap and, and there is no pharmaceutical companies that are really interested to support such a study. So we need to do it pure academically and that is uh, together with the difficulties in doing, doing that. Very interesting data. So I'm a bit puzzled if there's another bias in that. Yes. So if you look to the MSAID, um, you have also op uh, lower than one. I'm, I'm interested, so do you have a specific analysis of aspirin? I'm asking this because platelets um, play a very important role in inflammation and also the microcirculation. Yeah. And um, I, I reviewed recently another paper where there's also, um, they found a stronger association with, with another disease, with uh, aspirin and antiplatelet uh, treatments, and statins was also a confounder. So patients that use statins may also more frequently use aspirin. Mm. So this is also something you may. Mm, that, thank you for for, for, for the com Thank you for the comment. We can definitely separate between enzymes and. Concerning your result with the UDCA, uh, can you just tell us are the UDCA included in some recommendation uh, for this pathology, and uh, if so, do you think that your results should? Uh, uh, use more research in order maybe to, to change? I, I, I think that ERSO uh, is studied to that extent that it, uh, it can be in PC. We don't think that it's going to be studied further. They are included in guidelines and um, uh, still there, the evidence for beneficial effect is, 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 is not there for the hard endpoints. It is shown that it reduces uh, alkaline phosphatase levels and have a possible effect on, on uh, uh, prognosis, but it, is never, it was never shown in any meta-analysis or, 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 or that kind. The dose also matters, so... So, um, and possibly there is also, also a, a group of patients, as in primary biliary cholangitis, that respond to the treatment and improve their tests. And they might be the ones that benefit, but this is speculative. But if you read the ESL guidelines, you can see that ERSO uh, is, is, uh, is uh, recommended. Just a very short last question. This pretty much confirms what observing many other etiologies, and it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Did you have the chance of looking whether this is a class effect, or uh, so of any statins, or did you look also into different statins, or simvastatin, atorvastatin? Um, we we uh, what 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 did. We, what we did was that we just took the data, what kind of statins these people were on. And the majority were on simvastatin and atorvastatin 30% about, and the rest was a mixture of It others. is extremely interesting because in portal hypertension, simvastatin was really the drug with major effect on intrahepatic mm. circulation. Mm. And portal hypertension is a major dri driver of prognosis in MPSC, yes. so yes. it makes a lot of sense. Yes. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Thank you.
We will move to the next presentations, who are given by my colleague, uh, Dr. Marcus Kornberg, who will explain what are the real-life effectiveness and safety data of a new combination of uh, antiviral therapy for hepatitis C. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. Thanks, Annalisa. So um, I have the privilege here to present two abstracts. Um, I'm not also on these abstracts, uh, but I'm involved in these kind of real-world studies, uh, at least in one of the studies in the German data. So just uh, to give some introduction here, um, you're all aware of the development of HCV treatment. Um, we have now currently several drugs approved for the, uh, for the treatment of uh, chronic hepatitis C. Um, there are uh, three different classes of drugs. Um, there are protease inhibitors called Previas, the NS5A inhibitors, Asvias, and the polymerase inhibitors, Buvias. And, uh, there are two kinds, uh, which are nucleoside and non-nucleoside inhibitors. So, and um, in uh, July 26, there was a new approval uh, by uh, Glicaprevia, which is a protease inhibitor, and Pibentasvir, which is a second generation NS5A inhibitor, with a better profile uh, regarding some resistant associated substitutions. And um, now the, the importance here of these two abstracts is uh, the documentation of real world data. So background SVR rates of this compound, uh, Glicaprevia pibrentasvir, called Maviret, uh, was 98% in more than 2,200 patients in clinical phase two and three trials. However, and this also was mentioned in the first trial, real-world data on this regimen um, is currently limited, and there's so far no data because just was approved last year. And the question is, of course, do we si see similar SVR results with GP in the real world because patients may have comorbidities that have not been included in the phase two or three trials? And importantly, as we see, and this was also the talk, uh, the, the concept of the first talk, we want to treat the early stages, and we see more and more patients with early stage disease because we have improved screening programs and so on, and we have all treated our warehouse patients with cirrhosis, is the eight-week pan-genotypic regimen because it's an eight-week regimen suggested for naive patients without cirrhosis for this easy-to-treat cirrhotic patients. Is this effective in real world? And uh, of course, are there any safety signals? And um, this came out uh, just recently. The um, um, suggestion to treat with uh, Glicaprevia preventers via by the ESL guidelines, and you can see it is a pan-genotypic treatment for all genotypes, and for this easy-to-treat patient, it's eight weeks, for the cirrhotics, 12 weeks. There's one exception for treatment-experienced patients with genotype 3, but these patients are uh, becoming rare. So the first uh, abstract here is from Italy, uh, real-world uh, data for more than 700 patients included in this trial called Navigator 2. It's an interim analysis because not all of the uh, patients have so far reached a uh, cure uh, or the follow-up data. It's a retrospective longitudinal multicenter um, uh, registry and uh, HCV patients consecutively started GP from the beginning of October 2017. There were 30 centers in the Lombardy uh, region um, uh, involved in recruiting these patients. And uh, here are the uh, baseline characteristics of these patients. And you can see eight-week treatment was the majority of patients. So we have a treatment for a pan-genotypic treatment, all genotypes one, two, three, four, five, and six are rare in Europe. So we expect these genotypes to be frequent. And you can see that fibrosis uh, F0, F2, these early stages are 90% of the patients here in this uh, case, and only 1%, five patients, where have been maybe treated off-label for a shorter period of time. So even some patients with maybe early cirrhosis have been included, and you can see the longer treatment for 12, and sometimes 16 weeks. If you have genotype 3 in cirrhotics and pre-treatment, you have to treat 16 weeks. This is uh, in 61% uh, in this case. Of course, you expect this. Now, and the results is it's excellent. Yeah. So the real-world data fits to the to, to the data, and of course, SVR12 rates are not reached in, in so many patients, but SVR4, uh, you will not expect many relapses in this time, so you can see only one patient failed treatment 
excellent SVR rate, so we reached this 98%, which was also in the phase two and three trials. And of course, if you have only one relapser, you do not expect, and therefore this analysis is nonsense in my view, that there's any correlation with any factor. Of course, there's uh, the same result in HIV patients and older patients and uh, patients with kidney disease. This is uh, a nonsense analysis. So, um, re uh, safety signals and uh, of uh, the adverse events, just 6%, and of course patients sometimes have headache and uh, things like this. I always tell my patients when they ask, do I fear side effects here? And, and usually in the clinical trials, the adverse events were less compared to placebo because these drugs also have impact on the extrahepatic manifestation as was suggested in the, first, in the first talk. So patients feel better, they have less fatigue and so on. But still you see some uh, adverse events and here in the longer treatment some more, some prioritis and nausea, but of course these are patients with more advanced disease. You cannot compare this head to head because you have patients with cirrhosis here and uh, prioritis and nausea may be also related to the disease and not to the treatment. Now this is a study uh, and the registry uh, from German, it's uh, from the German Liver Foundation, uh, established the registry, now included more than 13,000 patients uh, and uh, part of this um, uh, included also patients with GP starting from uh, July 28 uh, until February 9th and uh, all patients have been enrolled, 80, uh, 866. Um, but uh, overall, this report uh, reports just 96 patients with SVR data. So again, not all of these patients uh, have reached follow-up um, 12 weeks after the end of treatment. And here again, the baseline characteristics, um, uh, more uh, genotype 1A than 1B patients have been recruited. This is because uh, we have some competitors, of course, in Germany, Zepat here for 12 weeks um, is also uh, prescribed, or Harvoni eight weeks. So there is some, um, some uh, this is not reflecting the genotype situation in Germany and more genotype three patients have been included because this is now the first eight week uh, uh, regimen for genotype three patients. And as also in the Italian study, we have most patients are treatment naive and most patients um, were non-serotics. And you can see this um, by this APRI score, which indicates no cirrhosis, 79% have lower than one. Platelets uh, is 221,000, so most patients are non-serotics, 93%, just 7% cirrhosis patient indicating. We see more and more this early to treat patients, uh, which was the point of the first presentation here. But also emphasizing real world data. So we have many patients with comorbidity here with more than one comorbidity, 71% of the patients, cardiovascular disease, HIV co-infecting, psychiatric disease, 13%. They have a lot of co-medications. This was excluded from the clinical trials. So this is important that we now have real world data in those patients. And this is the effectiveness, the intention to treat analysis, 97%. But this was because three patients discontinued treatment. Uh, there were uh, uh, some patients here with an IBD, cardiovascular insufficiency, so it has nothing to do with the treatment. One patient with psych uh, psychiatric disease, so comorbidity, and sometimes this comorbidity can make troubles, of course, not related to the, to the treatment, and uh, you have patients that drop out that we have to face in the future also in, these, in all the patients. And overall, so we have a per protocol analysis of 100%, no single treatment failure. So again, highlighting that this compound is effective and eight-week treatment, and most of the patients have been treated for eight weeks according to label. Adverse events, uh, any adverse events a bit more because, you know, it depends always what the patients or what the physicians document, if they document any headache and so on. And, uh, but the serious adverse events, less than 1%, uh, possible related to the treatment, and you can see there is uh, really not much um, headache, 9%, um, fatigue, 9%, headache, 8%, but patients with chronic hepatitis C have fatigue, and as just mentioned uh, in the clinical trials with cl uh, placebo-controlled, there was less fatigue compared to placebo. Conclusion, uh, first real-world data from Italy and uh, Germany demonstrate and confirm that GP achieved high SVR12 rates in patients with HCV infection, similar to rates observed in clinical trials. 
Discontinuations due to adverse events were rare, around 1%. Lab abnormalities were rare, less than 1%. So there is a very safe treatment, a pungenotypic for non-serotic naive patients for eight weeks. Uh, this is important when we consider elimination in the future. We want a simple regimen, that we want a point of care testing, an easy treatment. I gave yesterday a talk to if we, if we need a vaccine or so. We need, in the end, guidelines on the beer mat, yeah, that we have a very simple approach to treatment. And uh, just the last slide I want to mention, the 16-week suggestion yeah, for this patient. So we have sometimes complicated rules that we treat this for 16 weeks, this for 12 weeks. These are really rare patients. The majority of the patients, really what we see now and we want to treat in the future to eliminate HCV, are those easy to treat patients and we have this pan-genotypic treatment. And this is a basic concept and I think the first and this talk combines uh, pretty this, this concept that we want to eliminate, we want to find the patients and treat them. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's open for discussion. Today. Can you expand on what you were just saying about the point of care testing and the um, treatment guidelines? Uh, yeah, this is, um, I mean, the ESL guidelines also made a section, um, the new ones, where we address this point of a more easy approach. And um, Jean Michel Pavlotsky mentioned this also yesterday in the think tank, um, where it is possible, you know, testing for HCV at the moment, if you want to do it right, you need an anti-HCV antibody for the screening test, then you need confirmation with a PCR, HCV with a lower limit of detection, less than 15. But the new guideline states also, if you have point of care testing, maybe with a lower sensitivity of just 1,000, this can also be done, yeah, and is, is recommended uh, in, in maybe settings where you don't have the access to all these diagnostics. And this is the crucial part, Diagnostic rates are really the problem, and uh, Australia have 85% of the patients have been diagnosed. This is a country where maybe elimination works and the targets of WHO will be reached until 2030, maybe even before. But there are other parts of the world, Russia, India, so where diagnosis rates are just below 20, 30%, and in India I think it's 8%. There's an interesting model, the Punjab model, yeah, which is very interesting, um, where they did something, but India is, you know, has a large population, and I see someone in the back. And, uh, but uh, this is the key issue, to find the patients, and uh, otherwise we cannot treat them. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that is the case. I mean, there, if, if you have a country with a diagnosis rate of HCV than 8%, yeah, or, or less than, uh, than 10%, of course, you have many more patients that will be diagnosed at later stages. And we know the same for HIV in the past, and we talk about late presenting, yeah patients, late presenters, and we want to avoid this discussion, of course, in the future, therefore we, we need uh, elimination, and this is a biology of the disease, and you may be all aware of this Cochrane report recently, yeah, that this SVR and uh, has no impact on, and, and all this, because the data was analyzed in the wrong way, and if you just look to phase three data, of course, no one is dying in this in this short-term follow-ups. Yeah, you have to understand the biology of the disease. It's, it's a disease if patients get infected by IV drugs, in, for example, in prisons or so, when they are age of 30, you know, they change their life, and with the age of 60, they die from liver cirrhosis. And we need to, to prevent this. Yeah? Of course, the mortality due to drugs is much higher than liver-related mortality in these early years, when they are 20 or 30 years. But if you do not find these patients early, and just late when they are coming with cirrhosis, then if you cure them, okay, the virus is gone, but as, as was a point of the first talk, then you have the problem that patients still develop liver cancer and so on. Yeah? Because if you treat them too late, the late presenters, then you have a problem. And therefore, this concept to find them early, treat them early, they do not uh, progress to the disease, they do not transmit the disease to others, 
And uh, this is this, the concept we have. Yeah. Thank you, Marcus. We have to go on. Okay. Thank you very much. So it's my pleasure to invite to present this data Professor Paolo Angeli from Italy, who will um, talk about uh, epidemiology, predictors, and outcomes of multi drug resistance bacterial infections in patients with cirrhosis across the world. Final results of the global study. Thank you, Paolo. Thank you, Annalisa. Dear ladies, dear gentlemen, sorry. Let me introduce myself. I'm Paolo Angeli. I'm coming from the University of Padova, Italy. But I will speak here on behalf of the International Club of Ascites. This is a very special occasion for me because I will leave the role of secretary on Saturday. So I'm very, very proud to present you the result of one of the first real global study in the history of hepatology. And the aim of this study was uh, to investigate the epidemiology and the clinical outcomes of bacterial infection in patients with cirrhosis. You know, bacterial infection is a very common complication in this uh, special population. The rate of bacterial infection in cirrhotic patients is uh, fourfold higher than in the general population, and the impact of bacterial infection in cirrhotic patients is terrible. The rate of mortality due to bacterial infection is around 30% at one month and 63% at one year. So, as International Club of Ascites, we design the global study. You can see here all the involved center worldwide, and we were able to include uh, more than 1,300 patients in less than eight months. We are speaking about patients who were admitted to the hospital with a bacterial infection, or who developed the bacterial infection during the hospitalization. You can realize that uh, the patients were well distributed among the different geographical areas. In most of the patients, the cause of uh, cirrhosis was alcohol. Most of the patients at the time of enrollment uh, had decompensated cirrhosis. Uh, that means that they had ascites. So clinically significant portal hypertension. One third of them had acute on chronic liver failure and the mean MEL score was 21. Briefly to the results, you can see that almost half of the bacterial infection were community acquired. One four was LKR associated and one four was nosocomial. The most frequent bacterial infection uh, was uh, SBP followed by UTI, pneumonia, and others. We were able to have a positive result from culture in almost 60% of our patients. That is a great result. So we can say that uh, in almost 60% uh, of the cases, the infection was sustained by a gram-negative bacteria. In 34% of the cases, by a gram-positive bacteria. And in 4% of the cases, by fungi. Which bacteria are we dealing with? Among gram-negative E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Among gram-positive Enterococci, Staphylococcus aureus. But one of the main points of the study was uh, to investigate the rate of bacterial infection sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria or extensively drug resistant bacteria. And you can see that in 34% of the cases, 
the infection in cirrhotic patients was sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria and in 8% of the cases by extensively drug resistant bacteria. Which bacteria are we dealing with when we speak about multidrug resistant uh, bacteria? We are dealing with uh, extended spectrum beta lactamase enterobacteriate, Acinetobacter baumani, Pseudomonas, Vancomycin resistant enterococci, and Meticillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. Well, this is uh, the distribution of uh, infection sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria among the different geographic area. There is a huge difference. You can see that in India, the rate of infection sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria is higher than 70. In all the other geographical areas, it is lower than 35. As expected, nosocomial infection are more frequently sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria as compared to the community acquired, but please take care that in almost 40% of the cases, also the healthcare associated infection are sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria. Well, if we look at uh, the type of infection, you can see that more frequently than others, pneumonia, infection of soft tissue, and uh, infection of urinary tract are sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria. Finally, let me give you some information on uh, extensively drug resistant bacteria. We are speaking about uh, carbapenem resistant enterobacteriate. We are speaking about Acinectobacter baumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and Vancomycin resistant enterococci. Again, uh, a huge difference among the geographical area. You can see that in India, the rate of infection sustained by extensively drug resistant bacteria is higher than 35%. In all the other geographic area, it is below 7%, which is uh, the clinical outcome of infection sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria and extended drug resistant bacteria. You can see that uh, the efficacy of the first line empirical antibiotic treatment is much lower when the infection is sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria and extended drug resistant bacteria. This need to escalate uh, the first line empirical antibiotic treatment, but at the end of the day, this means uh, a lower probability to solve the infection. And this is uh, quite important because, you know, this means uh, that uh, when an infection is sustained by a multidrug resistant bacteria or extensively drug resistant bacteria, the probability to develop acute and chronic liver failure is higher, the probability to develop septic shock is higher, the probability to be transferred in ICU is higher, but overall, what is higher is in hospital mortality. So, speaking about the predictors of in hospital mortality, you can uh, look for uh, every scores uh, of severity of the liver disease, such as MELD, ACLF. You can look at any lab predictors of severity of the clinical conditions, such as CRP. But what makes uh, really the difference is uh, the failure of the first line antibiotic treatment, that is, uh, the strongest predictor of in-hospital mortality. So, in conclusion, infections sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria are very common in patients with cirrhosis, particularly in Asia and particularly in India. The risk factor for the development of infections sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria are previous treatment with antibiotics, uh, healthcare exposure, and also the type of infection. And you know, the efficacy of the first line antibiotic treatment is crucial to improve uh, the survival of cirrhotic patients with a bacterial infection. 
Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Paul. It's open for discussion. Hi, uh, Ed Sussman with uh, MedPage today. Uh, could you define the difference between healthcare um, exposure and nosocomial infection? Yeah. You know, nosocomial infection is an infection that develops a 84, 72 hours after the admission to the hospital. While healthcare associated infection is an infection that developed before that time in a patient who during the last uh, three, six months has been admitted to the hospital, also the one day hospital, or uh, is coming from some uh, healthcare structures such as uh, structure for old people or something like this. Um, Neil Oster, while Medscape. Uh, so could you speculate on why India had such much higher multi-drug resistance? Yeah, we have some idea on this. What is different in India is uh, the access to the second, third line antibiotics. The access is uh, quite facilitated. I can say is almost free. And this is probably the reason why in this uh, important country, the rate of infection sustained by multidrug resistant bacteria and extensively drug resistant bacteria is so high. Is this because they have uh, generic drugs available? So exactly. Just a quick question from my side. These are very alarming data, Paolo. Yeah. So over 30% of multidrug resistance anywhere, more or less, in the world is really alarming. And at the moment, we are awaiting new antibiotic therapy that could overcome the problem. But in the meanwhile, I think we, we should all be aware of all the measures of hygiene and isolation of these patients that could help in reducing these alarming data, is it? Absolutely. A surveillance programs in each center is crucial, you know? So the, the performing of the a swab on uh, a regular basis in high risk patient, patient coming from other hospital, patient coming from ICU and so and so and so is crucial to reduce uh, the spread of this type of bacteria inside your unit. Thank you very much. I think we have to move to the last presentation. Thank you, Paolo. So it's a pleasure to invite uh, the next speaker, who is Dr. Gagandeep Singh, who will present us the data on decentralized care is effective in management of patients with hepatitis C in public health care setting, the Punjab model. Thank you very much. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you, Easel, for giving a chance to present the Punjab model. And this is decentralized care is effective in a public health care setting. And I'm myself a public health specialist looking after the implementation of this program in my state in India. Punjab is basically a northern state in India surrounded by uh, international borders and different cultures with a total population of around 29 million and 22 districts where we have district hospitals. We don't have gastroenterologists and hepatologists in those hospitals, but yes, we do have medical specialists and other specialists and three government medical colleges. I'm just giving the background how we started with the things. In 2014 and 16, we started with procurement of the drugs and interferons were available, but they were made available at a lesser rate to the general public and Unfortunately, the data was not captured how many patients were put on treatment, how many patients were achieving SVR or something. There was no data and all that. So we had no record of outcomes and the rates, drug treatment cost was really very high as per the Indian standards and the people who couldn't afford that. And we had some information, there was no national program that there was HCV prevalence was higher in Punjab in certain population due to different factors, injection, drug use, and other factors they were there, but still there was no data. So we captured the data of State AIDS Control Society and certain private doctors, and we could say that yes, the prevalence was quite higher in this than the national average. 
Then in 2016, we launched this Mukmantri Punjab Hepatitis C Relief Fund. This is basically Chief Minister Relief Fund for Hepatitis C. And uh, Dr. R. K. Dhiman from PGI in Chandigarh, they, he was a technical advisor. So it was a totally state initiative. Like my previous speaker was saying, there is no national program per se in India now. The Indian government is now working on it. It is expected to be launched this year. It is based on again on Punjab model. And we prepare the documentation, the SOPs are available on the website. The principles were standardization. Regimens were made for different genotypes and different category of the patient so that whenever a doctor is prescribing a different part, it has to be standardized treatment. Equity, it was free of cost to all religions, barring all their buying capacity or anything, anybody is accessible. It was available in a decentralized mode. In 22 district hospital and three government medical colleges, 25 centers we provided the drugs so that patients they don't have to move to a distance so they can get the treatment at their near place and it was affordable because it was free of cost to the patient and government is paying for all the costs. And before that starting that we train and capacity building of medical specialists of all these centers and the paramedical staff in handling the drugs and issuing the drugs and how to fill and record and m and &E. they were trained before launching in collaboration with PGI. And we have eco model working in this where every fortnight from PGI we are working with all the medical specialists and they discuss all the cases and differences there. This picture or screenshot of the eco group where all the medical specialists they discuss their difficult cases. Currently, uh, like we were talking about testing, uh, anti HCV ELISA, CBC, LFT, RFT, INR, they're all free of cost in these 25 centers and patients, they don't have to pay anything, and government is booking the cost on this. When we started, the viral load was around 33 US dollars and it decreased to 27 in this year, March, and tenders, it has come down to 13 US dollars. And genotype, is now 13.5 US dollars. And viral load, at 12 week viral load, it's free of cost. We have done this uh, collaboration with a private diagnostic lab and this cost patient is paying. The treatment, the earlier tests, they are free of cost to the patient. Patient has to pay only for viral load and genotype and now we are working, uh, if all goes well, by June, we'll be able to wave off this cost and still government will be bearing this cost as well. So we had different regimens for genotype 1, 4, 5, and 6. Without cirrhosis, it was soft plus leddy, and with cirrhosis, it was soft leddy plus riba. For genome 2 and 3, it's soft decla, without cirrhosis, and soft decla plus riba. If we look at the cost, when we started, it was maximum patients they are on regimen 3, they are genotype 3, 70% patients they are on genome 3, and the cost was 279 USD. That has come down to 67 USD now for 12-week regimen therapy. So Prices, they are very less, they are decreased in Punjab. And the algorithm which is being followed is all the HCV are in a positive patients. If they don't have cirrhosis, we start with soft decla. And if it's present, then we have to go for the genotype. If it is genome one and four, it's again soft lady plus riba and cirrhosis and soft decla and riba, this. But currently we are not doing ETR, few physicians they go for ETR, we are not going for ETR, we are not recommending, we are going for SVR12 and all the results are based on SVR12. Currently to follow up the patient we design the treatment cards, medical details and all the regimens and follow ups and they will maintain this is the prototype of the treatment card with all the risk factors and all the follow ups which the hospital records they are being maintained. And we are issuing this SVR card to the patient that is designed a pink ship, so the patient takes the SVR card to the lab, it's free of cost. So the lab will not charge anything from that patient, it's filled. And in WHO, in collaboration with WHO, we have designed this SVR certificate. Everybody who's achieving SVR is given a certificate that you have been cured of the disease at this point of time. But at the back side of the disease, we are writing that it is now. If you're still in the risk factor, you can again get the disease. So counseling is being done at the same point of time. Uh, till 31st of March, we had enrolled around 41,000 patients. And if I go to the report I got from the India and today morning, it is 43,774 patients today enrolled. And out of those around 38,000, they have completed treatment. And out of these, uh, SVR was due of 34,000, 26,000 they have done SVR test. And Cure rate is going around 92%. In 
If we look at this, cure rate is 92%. Now we are working with PGI in collaboration with the one or two external agencies. We are going for being public health specialists. I'm going for an epidemiological study for the patients who have interrupted. It's around 2,000 patients who have interrupted and 2,000 patients they have failed. So all the patients who have failed, we have preserved the their samples so that we can do that RAV testing for that in, in collaboration with PGI. When we started for the first two, three months, it was a peak, it was a load, and now it's a plateau of around 1, 1,500 patients per month we are getting. And these all are passive patients. We are not going any actively to the patient household. Patients, they're coming on their own as far as knowing their status. And if you look at the outcome, whether it is cirrhotic, either 85% of non-cirrhotic and around 15% of the patients, they are cirrhotic in our case study. And outcomes in cirrhotic and non-cirrhotic is around 91% SVR has been achieved in both the patients. And maximum patients, as I told, 75% patients are Geno3. And outcomes in Geno3 is 91.4 and it's less in Geno2. The patients, actual patients, they are very less. Only five patients are there enrolled in this group. And Geno6 are only two patients. If I look at the regimens we have made for this, uh, maximum patients are in regimen three, that's 77%, as I told, they are in regimen three, and cure rate and SVR percentage is almost the same in all the groups, only in uh, regimen two, where we're giving soft lady and riba is a little less, rather we are getting around more than 91% in all the genos. Males, they are slightly overnumbered, 64% and 36% are the females. Um, but outcome is slightly better in females because adherence was found to be better in females. We're still studying on that. The younger, we have not uh, enrolled most of the pediatric patients, only the overweight patients they were enrolled. And if you look at this, the most productive age group between 21 to 50, they're the maximum number of the patients involved. And, and most of the patients, they have a history of different injections from quacks or different practitioners. And again, the results are almost similar in all the age groups. For this, we are collaborating already with Clinton Health Assess Initiative. They have a part to in monitoring and evaluation, all the data analysis and all the data they are being captured in collaboration with them. For the last two years, we're working with them. And now in active intervention, we are going ahead with active intervention. All we have uh, done with passive, the patient load is coming down. Uh, so we are moving ahead with active in intervention. And the first phase, uh, all the patients, HIV positive patients, are already registered with our AIDS Control Society and all the IV drug users who are registered. We are starting screening of those patients from May onwards so that they can be checked for because they have the same high risk factors, they can be screened for HCV and if they are, they will be put on treatment and for this we are collaborating with uh, Foundation of Innovative New Diagnostics FIND and they are providing us four gene expert machines free of cost and for gene expert we will be doing viral load of these patients free of cost and treatment will be provided. So we are committed with this thing, uh, enrolled more than 40,000 patients. And like previous speakers are saying, there's uh, resistance, yes. I was discussing with other persons, yes. That's an issue in uh, India, although because the GPs, uh, they can prescribe antibiotics and sometimes they go to second line to third line drugs on their own. But now uh, government has commitment to that. The surveillance module has been started to know the re different resistance patterns in the country and I'm part of in North India, I'm part of that group. We're working on what type of bacteria are there, how much resistance is there and what antibiotics they need to be changed. Similarly, uh, with this, uh, there was no data now. The government of India knows one state can do it and now other states, they are following the Punjab pattern and now the government of India is going to launch national action plan for hepatitis and it will be on Punjab model and I hope uh, by this year, June or July, it will be launched and the pre-treatment will be provided to all the HAPSI patients that will be free of cost. Thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting data. This is open for discussion, please. Sure. Hello, welcome to page two. I had a question for the moderator. What is required public health-wise to scale this up? You know, is this, is this a feasible model for other countries? In the United States, or Europe, and then what, what type of public health investment is necessary to make this happen, do you think it's possible? I think this is quite complicated because this is depending very much on regulation in each country. Sure. And uh, maybe you know more than me regarding <laughs> the cost and the organization uh, of the system. Exactly. It is not, definitely not possible in all countries. Theoretically it could, but it's not for regulation. Exactly. Well, 
if you talk about it's not applicable in all the states we have 35 states in the country and only punjab started and now second state haryana our neighboring state they have started the program first of all we need to know the data how much prevalence you have and then you have to all the governments whether it is some state government or national government or india or europe or usa everything will they will come on the cost how much it will be cost effective and how it will be cost benefited so governments they are going to calculate the whole that the revenues and budget and everything yes it's a need of the r like the rates they have declined so much in punjab so that that's why the government of india the forced to see when we came from 300 dollars to 67 dollars with around 40000 patients we can bring down the rates all the pharma industries they were in their putting you won't believe all the major manufacturers they were in punjab for the tender for the fighting we have soft well this year and the rates are so less and and the government of india is forced to think onto that yes it is achievable if the plan the budget can be planned it all depends on the availability of the drugs and cost thank you is there any other question thank you very much so thank you very much thank you i would like to close this session and i would like to thank you all for coming to goodbye